113 Questions About Evolution with John Perry. Evolutionary question number 23. What is gain of function research? Several weeks ago, I started getting a lot of different emails from people asking about gain of function research. I've received so many emails that I've decided to just take some of the best parts of some of the best emails and just combine them into one here. And these chunks of these emails pretty much cover everyone's questions on the topic, so hopefully this will be adequate for you all. Today's video isn't going to be quite as fun as a lot of our videos are here. Gain of function research is possibly the most terrifying application of the principles of evolution yet devised. All of the information for this presentation comes from either publications of scientific literature or directly from the federal government. Uh, there's been pretty massive and public debate about gain-of-function research ever since it started. Arguably, it started in 2012. Yeah, all of this stuff is online. The documents are fairly lengthy. I have links to everything down in the video description. The paper that I thought was most interesting is the white paper, the gain-of-function research ethical analysis. And I've actually got a link to my copy of that, which I've highlighted. So, you know, it's just a PDF, but I've I've, I've saved my highlights of that for you in case you're interested in the, the things that jumped out to me. I should point out that I think the reason there's been so much curiosity about this recently is actually because of Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's had a bunch of people coming on his podcast to talk about gain-of-function research. And uh, you know, some of what they're saying is correct. Some of what they're saying is not correct. So uh, anyway, th this hopefully will give you a really solid introduction so that when you hear the things that people are saying about this online, a lot of people are trying to link it to COVID uh, and so on. This is going to give you a really good outline of what's true, what's not true, what's important here. Again, from the perspective of actual published scientific papers, as well as the debates that have been published by the federal government about this, because yeah, there, there have been massive debates. Here's just some excerpts from the letters people have been sending me. I've been hearing about gain-of-function experiments where scientists take viruses from the wild and make them more dangerous in the lab. Is this really happening? If so, why? Well, the answer to that question, unfortunately, is yes. And I'll tell you why scientists are doing that research during the rest of this video. Next, does this research really save lives somehow? Even still, is it worth the risk? Then, it seems the world is put at risk by these experiments. Even if they do give us new medicines, people in poorer nations will always be last in line for those new treatments. And then the last letter that I got here was actually from a younger kid who's who watches my videos with his dad, and his dad's actually having him do a homeschool assignment on gain-of-function experiments. And uh, his his letter was kind of funny to read, but he says, My cousin told me they make viruses inside mutant mice. Did you see the mouse with an ear on its back? Yes, I did see the mouse with an ear on its back. And actually, as weird as it sounds, your cousin kind of is correct. These experiments are done on mice that have special mutations that make them unique for these types of experiments. So yeah, essentially, your cousin is correct. So let's dig in here to gain-of-function research, and let's start a little bit back in time before gain-of-research became an issue and look at just virus research in general and why it is that there's good reason to be concerned. This experiment right here, published in Science, the journal Science, is one of the most controversial studies ever done and published. What these scientists did is they went on the internet, they looked up the DNA sequence for the polio virus, and then they built it in their lab. All they had was the sequence. And so they were able to reconstruct the DNA of the polio virus. They were able to get that DNA to function inside of a cell and actually build the polio virus. And they had, now they had polio in their laboratory. Polio is a highly controlled virus, right? Only a few research labs in the world are allowed to have it and study it. And so they just went online, grabbed the, <laughs> grabbed the DNA sequence for it, and just built it in their lab. And then they published it saying, hey, uh, this is a problem. Anyone can do this. We did it in a normal college laboratory. Uh, maybe we should be concerned about this. And yeah, it raised concern. The government was aware that this stuff is dangerous. It could be used for good. It could be used for evil. And obviously, if you're creating dangerous viruses, they can they can leak out of your lab. Someone can get accidentally infected who works in the lab and then accidentally spread that 
far and wide, or, of course, this could happen malevolently. You could get an angry researcher who just wants to watch the world burn, and that person could release it, or you could get an enemy of the state who bribes somebody or steals something. This is dangerous. This kickstarted a debate about whether or not this type of research should even be published, whether or not it should be done, and that debate is still raging today, and gain of function is just another chapter in this debate. Before you can really make sense of why it is that we would ever want to do gain-of-function research or any sort of dangerous virus research, it's important to realize that there is a real threat of new viruses coming at us from the wild and from our own farms. What we're seeing right here is a picture of what is called factory farming. This is how we produce eggs and meat. We have these super farms, and these super farms are really good at quickly producing large quantities of meat and eggs and dairy, but, you know, of course there are animal rights issues with the way that we treat animals in these conditions. And more importantly for today's discussion, these types of farms are really good at producing new viruses by accident. Now, this farm that we're looking at here is a, a nice, really well-funded, fairly clean farm. I mean, obviously the animals aren't probably being treated very nicely there. They're stuck in tiny little cages. But there are places that are a lot worse than this as far as sanitation goes. Here's another example of a farm. This is probably one of the worst examples of an egg farm where obviously this place is filthy and new viruses, new diseases could be evolving here, you know, in places like this as we speak. People who work in farms like this often get sick from viruses that would not ever otherwise jump into humans because they're, these viruses exist in such high quantities in these areas. People are exposed to them. And every time you have people exposed to an animal virus, there is a chance that that virus can evolve and adapt and end up jumping over into humans and spreading airborne through humans. But even if that doesn't happen, the way that these farms are set up just allows new diseases to evolve that can better infect chickens. And, you know, if you've got an economy and a food supply that's based on massively producing chickens and turkeys and whatever else, if you suddenly disturb that food production with a virus or a disease of some kind, you can have an economic catastrophe. I mean, your, your whole system can collapse. Back in 2015, 43 million birds had to be culled because of a new virus that evolved called H5N2. It spread like wildfire in the U.S. through turkeys and chickens. It actually evolved earlier. I think it was first reported in 2005, but 2015 was when it really hit the U.S. poultry industry. 43 million birds were culled. They, they had to kill them in order to prevent the further spread of the virus. They killed them and threw them away. Just to put that in perspective, the entire state of Texas only has 29 million people who live in that state. So we killed almost twice the population of Texas in birds because of one new virus that evolved. So that sucked. <laughs> this is a photograph from the 1918 Spanish flu. It killed between 20 and 50 million people, young and old. So it was a lot worse than COVID. It was killing everybody. It's like, doesn't matter how old you are. They were dropping dead. It was catastrophic. Just like today, everyone had to wear masks when they went to work. <laughs> this is a really interesting photograph. This strange device that they had invented that looks super, super uncomfortable. Just like today, there were anti-mask groups. And it's really funny how history repeats itself. We all act like this is the first time we've ever had to deal with such horrible violations of our freedoms. But this is actually a thing that happens every time a virus breaks out. And that 1918 Spanish flu, we actually believe now was caused by farming where people were mixing chickens and pigs. They were farming them in the same vicinities. When viruses jump from pigs to chickens and back and forth again, they can actually mutate and evolve and then gain the ability to infect humans. We don't really do this anymore. In modern factory farms, we don't do pigs and chickens right next to each other because of this. This is one of the things that we learned from back then. But still, what we're doing in our meat industry is very problematic. And because of that, so the argument goes, we need to be doing gain-of-function research experiments to understand just how dangerous things are and what it is that we should be watching out for. This experiment right here is the one that really, really kick-started the debate around gain-of-function experiments. This research was done at a very prestigious lab in the Netherlands. Scientists took a look at a virus called H5N1. H5N1 is a virus that birds can transmit to each other through the air, so when a bird sneezes, when it has this flu, it can pass that to another bird. But if humans get this virus, they cannot pass it to each other just by sneezing. 
People who work with birds will get this virus from their birds if their birds have it. So people who work in chicken factories and, and so on, they can get it. And by the way, when humans do get this virus, there's about a 60% death rate. So it's extremely, extremely dangerous. Not something that you want to get. But it's not transmissible. I mean, if you get it, you will probably die, <laughs> but you're not going to pass it on to your family members. You're not going to, it's not going to become a pandemic. So that's good news. But scientists were curious, could it actually evolve to become a deadly pandemic? Could it evolve the ability to spread from human to human? And so what they did is they actually tested it out in ferrets. Humans and ferrets get each other sick quite often. Same with humans and minks. You might have heard that COVID has jumped into minks. That's been a big problem. The reason for that is that we just have our, our respiratory systems are very similar. So what they did in this research is they took a strain of H5N1 and they squirted it into the nose of ferrets. And they kept on doing this to see if the virus would evolve and adapt just through the normal process of Darwinian evolution, just descent with modification, acted upon by selection. Would it evolve to become an airborne virus in mammals? And sure enough, it did. It took 10 transfers from one ferret to the next by, you know, actually squirting it into the nose of the ferrets. Sure enough, it took hold and it could indeed spread through the air from one ferret to another. This virus, which has a 60% mortality rate for humans when humans get it, now, because of an adaptation that it obtained in the laboratory, can spread from mammal to mammal, and probably from human to human. They didn't actually try and see if it could spread from human to human, but it probably could spread from human to human. And so this was obviously extremely controversial. In fact, some people have said that this might be the most dangerous virus known to man right now. I mean, you, you have other things that have, have caused catastrophic deaths in the past. You've got, you've got uh, smallpox, you have the Black Plague. Hey, Black Plague's not a virus, but for something with this mortality rate and the ability to spread like the flu, was the risk justifiable? The answer is maybe. <laughs> the really important thing that they discovered was that, yeah, because of the way that we currently raise chickens and turkeys and so on, we could actually have this evolve in one of our factories. Dr. Fauci, back in 2012, was very concerned with this research. He says, the scientists who triggered this debate have conducted their research properly and under the safest and most secure conditions. However, similar future research might be conducted in suboptimal conditions, in countries or institutions with weaker infrastructure or research oversight systems. So he was very concerned that even though this one was okay, everything was contained, it was done responsibly, That's that might not be how things happen in the future. And I want you to pay close attention to the, the, the confidence that Fauci has in the American and European research facilities right here that he's, he's displaying because that confidence is actually going to uh, crumble <laughs> just two years from now. So that was 2012 that he said this. Within two years, the, the confidence in the American and European safety of our virology institutions that will that will uh, go a little bit sour as we're about to find out. Dr. David Relman from Stanford was very very upset about this research. He says it is unethical to place so many members of the public at risk and then consult only scientists or even worse just a small subset of scientists and exclude others from the decision making and oversight process. In many cases conversations have only involved infectious disease researchers and conflicts of interest among participants have not been adequately acknowledged or addressed. It is our responsibility as scientists to explain the rationale behind our work including its benefits and risks to the general public in terms that are accessible to those with an average level of education rather than to be dismissive. Oh, hey, look, that's, that's what I'm trying to do right now. This is especially important when the work has important consequences for the whole of society, which is obviously the case with gain-of-function research. In spite of the concerns put forth by Fauci and Relman, gain-of-function research did continue. In 2014, this paper was published called Airborne Transmission of Highly Pathogenic H7N1 Influenza Virus in Ferrets. So again, this is a very similar experiment to the one done before. People took a chicken disease, a chicken virus, and made it so that it was airborne transmissible in ferrets, and then probably airborne transmissible in humans. Now again, the thing that they discovered in this research was arguably very important. They showed that the virus can actually 
transfer from birds to mammals in a way that's a lot easier than we suspected earlier. The earlier experiments that we did, it showed that there was some pretty complex mutations that had to happen. And it seemed like it was fairly or somewhat unlikely that it would happen in just the normal factory farm setting. But this, this experiment showed us that actually there's more than one way for the virus to evolve and adapt to mammals. So some of the people that say that, yeah, we, we learned some cool things with that study, but it wasn't really worth it. One of their concerns is the fact that this research was done at the University of Maryland, which is just, you know, 27 minute drive from the White House. <laughs> it's a major heavily populated area of the world. And it's only, you know, 42 minutes away from an international airport. It seems like it might be a little bit reckless, even though we, we have confidence that our facilities are really safe, our research facilities. Why are we doing this in the middle of a city? Why are we doing this next to the White House? Why are we doing this next to an international airport? Why? Why? But our laboratories are safe, right? So what's the big deal? Well, on October 17th, 2014, spurred by incidents at U.S. government laboratories that, are, that raised serious biosafety concerns, the U.S. government launched a one-year deliberative process to address the continuing controversy surrounding so-called gain-of-function research on respiratory pathogens with pandemic potential. What happened is that, you know, at these amazing American laboratories, top-notch, best in the world, there were three incidences, three accidents that made everyone question how safe our labs really are. And what the federal government did because of that is they halted all of the experiments that we were doing on gain-of-function research. They, well, they, hunt, they halted funding for those experiments. And they immediately said, we need to address this. We need to have a conference about this. We need to spend some time and energy figuring out whether or not this is worth it. And that's where all of these documents that I'm, I, I've been getting this information from, that's where they come from. They were produced during this time, started in 2014, where people started meeting about this stuff. But before I go into what was decided at these meetings, let's talk about these three laboratory incidences because they're they're fairly terrifying. All of these three things happened in the year 2014. So workers were exposed to live anthrax at a CDC lab in Atlanta, Georgia. Smallpox was found in a freezer at a non-secure NIH lab in Bethesda, Maryland. Again, that's near Washington, D.C. Smallpox, okay, smallpox was found in a freezer, just hanging out there, just in some vials. And then H5N1, that really nasty virus that kills 60% of the people who get it, that was accidentally shipped from Atlanta, the CDC's biosafety lab, to a poultry lab in Athens, Georgia. Luckily, nobody got sick. Actually, nobody got sick or hurt during any of these incidences. But I want you to think about this. Atlanta, Georgia has a CSA population of 6 million people, over 6 million people. A CSA population is the not just the population of people who live in the city. That's like half a million that live in Atlanta. But it's all the people that they have physical contact with. So the people who drive in and drive out for work every day and so on. That's the population of people that would immediately be exposed to a disease if it broke out from one of these labs. And in 2019, the International Airport in Atlanta, Georgia, was the busiest airport in the world. Isn't this a problem? <laughs> like, should we be doing this? Is this smart? So... People started having meetings about this. During this meeting, one of the things that they did is they outlined what is gain-of-function research and what types of gain-of-function research are the most dangerous. And so I'm going to give you their, their more dangerous definition of gain-of-function research because that term actually applies to a bunch of things. But they decided that for, for the regulations they're going to put forth, gain-of-function research is any virology experiment that increases the pathogenicity, transmissibility, or immune and drug resistance of viruses. In particular, viruses that could start pandemics. There are a lot of viruses that we deal with that are super dangerous, but they, they're not going to start a wide-scale pandemic. So this was specifically for viruses that can be transmitted through the air, is what they decided. For, for the regulations that they would end up coming up with. In layman's terms, gain-of-function research is any experiment that makes a virus more dangerous, specifically a virus that could cause a pandemic. 
So what's the point of gain of function research? The point is to see how close a particular virus is to being able to infect humans. That's what we did with these different chicken viruses, right? Another reason to do gain of function research is to find out specifically how a virus infects humans. This work on ferrets, it actually did show us. We could, we could learn exactly how the virus was getting into ferret lungs and why it was that it was transmitting from ferret to ferret and, you know, probably would also work transmitting from human to human. Another really cool thing that gain of function research lets us do is it, is it lets us test how it is that resistance to medicines will evolve. So if we develop a medicine for viruses, how will viruses evolve to adapt to that medicine? And so we do this by infecting animals with viruses, and then we treat those animals with our best medicines, and then we see how the virus evolves and overcomes those medicines. You can also do that to see how the virus simply overcomes the human immune system. So how frequently will we need to do booster shots and so on? And then the last big perk of doing gain-of-function research is that it helps us understand the genotype to phenotype link in viruses. So when we talk about the genotype of an organism, we're talking about its DNA sequence or its RNA sequence, as is the case with, with many viruses. They have an RNA genome, not a DNA genome. For the most part, we don't really know how it is that genes code for traits in an organism, including the traits of a virus. And to figure that out, we have to do very careful research and some of it falls under the category of gain of function research. We need to tweak, slightly tweak these viruses, slightly tweak their genes and see what happens. And in this process, we could accidentally give them new functions that we did not intend, or we might actually purposely give them new dangerous functions in part. So, you know, we'll look at the genome of a, of a dangerous virus and we'll say, oh, it's got these seven mutations and we'll take a less dangerous virus and one by one, We'll, we'll change its DNA to give it each of those seven mutations one by one and see, you know, what happens. Like, how is it that these mutations cause the ability to actually become more dangerous? And that is arguably very important research. It's, it, these are things that we want to understand. But, of course, during this process, you might accidentally spread one of these viruses that you've made in the laboratory, and that kind of defeats the whole purpose. By the way, the reason I have a bat on here is because we do a lot of this research on coronaviruses, and I'm not going to go into that in depth here, because I'll, I'll do that in a future video, on people's concerns that the current coronavirus that's infecting us might, might have come about through gain-of-function experiments. I'm going to talk in depth about that. That needs its own video. <laughs> You know, a lot of people say that that's just a conspiracy theory. Others say, no, it's legitimate. To really give it the appropriate attention that it needs, I need to do a whole video just on that. And I will, don't worry. But that's for another day. So how is it that, that scientists give viruses new functions? How does this actual research work? Well, one <laughs> involves these mutant mice that uh, one of our viewers was asking about earlier. So I've got a picture of the, the mutant mouse with an ear on his back. But one of the ways is, is called serial passage experiments. And we can do these in human cell cultures or we can do them in humanized animal models. Now, we don't actually grow ears on mice's backs to do these. It's not ears that we use, but we actually use the same type of mouse that was used in that ear experiment. A lot of people were confused with that ear experiment back when it was published. They thought that scientists had, had edited the mouse's genes so that the mouse would grow a human ear. That's not what happened. What they did is they, they edited the mouse's genes, they knocked out the genes that it used to control its own immune system. So that, that type of mouse does not have an immune system. And because it doesn't have an immune system, you can grow all sorts of things inside of it. In this case, they grew a human ear by, uh, well, they used cartilage actually from cows and they used a scaffolding that they, <laughs> it was complicated, but the mouse's DNA is not coding for that ear. The only thing they did genetically to the mouse is they knocked out its immune system. But we used that same type of mouse and we actually put human lung tissue in these mice's skin. And that allows them to be pretty good models for how it is that a particular type of virus will spread in a human lung. Believe it or not, it actually works as a fairly good model for the human lung by just putting a chunk of lung tissue underneath the skin of a mouse that doesn't have an immune system. <laughs> and so that's, that is what we do. It's weird. 
but that's what we do. Another thing that we do, people have created mice that have human genes in their lungs. So this is actual gene editing of a mouse that gives it human lung genes. They still have little mouse shaped lungs. They don't grow a giant human lung, but they have receptors on those cells in those lungs that are the same as the receptors that humans have in their lungs. And that means that the diseases that infect those mice can also infect humans. And they actually behave fairly similarly in the mouse, the viruses do, as they do in humans. So, but what do we mean by serial passage? Serial passage is what we've been talking about with the ferrets. So what you do is you take a virus that doesn't infect humans very well. Maybe it's a bird virus or maybe it's a bat virus, a, a coronavirus of some kind. And you take one of these humanized animals and you squirt the virus either into their lungs or the the modified human lung in their back, in the case of the surgically enhanced mice. <laughs> you squirt the virus in there in really high concentrations. And even though it's not very good at getting into those cells, those human cells, some of them will manage to get into those human cells and, and cause an infection. Then you remove that lung, you destroy it, you pull out the viruses, and you inject it into another humanized mouse. And you keep on doing that until it evolves the ability to really efficiently infect human lungs. That is what a serial passage experiment is. I want to point out here that scariness aside, it's really cool that evolution is that powerful. They, all we're doing, we're, they're not actually doing genetic engineering in this case. They're just squirting the virus into a new host. And the normal process of evolution, just Darwinian evolution, descent with modification, acted upon by selection, that simple process is all it takes the other type of experiment is chimera production. This is where you take two different types of viruses and you inject them into one type of host. When two types of viruses infect one type of cell, they create kind of what you could think of as a hybrid of the virus through a process of either recombination or reassortment. Flus are really good at reassortment. I'm not gonna go into the details of that, what that means, but they're really good at producing hybrids if two different types of flu viruses get into one animal. And coronaviruses are really good at recombination, so it's a different type of, you could call it a hybrid that gets produced. So one of the things that was suggested early on for the origin of the coronavirus, the, the new one that's been killing people in 2020, was that a pangolin strain of coronavirus ended up mixing with a bat strain of coronavirus, possibly in the meat market, wildlife trade, and that maybe that's where the new virus, how the new virus evolved. Maybe the new virus is a hybrid of pangolin coronaviruses and bat coronaviruses. And that's still something that's somewhat considered to be a possibility now, but it seems to have fallen out of popularity among different researchers. But that's a process that can also be done in the laboratory by infecting one animal with two different strains of a virus. And then you have what's called reverse genetics, which often involves lab-induced recombination. And this is where you use genetic editing techniques to really fine-tune what you're doing and what types of modifications you're making to the genome of a virus. This book right here is a summary of a workshop that federal government put on back in it was 2014 to really discuss and debate the potential risks and benefits of gain-of-function research. Obviously, it's dangerous. The risks, of course, are accidental leak of an enhanced strain of virus, something that maybe might not ever evolve in the wild, but certainly could evolve or be engineered in the lab. These viruses could be released not just accidentally, but also on purpose through malevolent actors. And there actually have been cases in the past of people who are angry at their bosses or whatever in laboratories, and they will purposely infect their boss or one of their coworkers. They'll purposely infect their personal protection equipment and end up killing somebody. That's happened before in labs. Just human nature, we do messed up things from time to time. So this could be like a, just a bad guy that works in the lab that could do this, or it could be an actual terrorist group that's you know bribing someone or threatening someone or actually just breaking into a facility and stealing stuff. You know, in the past, we've had animal rights activists who go in and destroy laboratories or people who are just upset about the type of research happening in a laboratory, that people will go in and destroy a laboratory or try to release the animals. That, of course, <laughs> you know, if it's the wrong laboratory, that could cause a pandemic. So that's dangerous. The fact that we publish data when we discover it 
that could be used by terrorists to create their own deadly viruses. And then, of course, these experiments provide opportunity for the evolution of unpredicted capabilities. You know, in a laboratory, you've got all sorts of cell cultures from all types of different animals. You've got different lab animals that have been mutated in a bunch of different ways. If you were to have a virus not escape the laboratory, but just escape an ex a specific experiment and start infecting other cells that you have in culture and other animals and so on, you can have a situation where it's evolving and adapting rapidly to all sorts of different organisms because you have all these different lab animals and all these different cell cultures in your laboratory. Insane things could happen in this scenario. Just like who knows what's going to end up evolving in these cases. So this is, this is really dangerous now. In like a top level biosecurity lab, all of the animals are always treated as if they're infected. It's, it, they kind of treat all the animals at these laboratories as if they are loaded guns, right? But still, it's, it's a dangerous scenario that we're, we're, we've created for ourselves here. They noted that with some exceptions of influenzas, enhanced viruses are not usually as bad as the most dangerous current wild strains of viruses. This means that gain-of-function research is usually no more dangerous than research on wild-type strains, wild viruses. That said, unexpected traits can develop during gain-of-function research. Then, of course, they talk about the potential benefits. Gain-of-function research is often the only way to determine how a virus functions. There's just not many other good ways. Gain-of-function is often the only way to see how a virus adapts to treatment. If you have a treatment that works, but you're worried that the virus might evolve a way to avoid that treatment, Gain of function research really is the only way to do that. And then gain of function research tells us which wild strains are close to spilling over, spilling over into human populations. Gain of function research allows us to study the genotype phenotype link. The hope with gain of function research is that someday we'll, we'll understand viruses so well that we won't need to do gain of function research ever again because we will understand perfectly how it is that genotype determines phenotype in viruses. And so we'll be able to just take a sequence of DNA or RNA, pop it into a computer, and that computer will tell us whether or not this can infect humans, if it can, exactly how it does it, how transmissible it'll be, and so on. But we are definitely not able to do that right now. We are a long, long way from that type of knowledge. But it's argued that gain-of-function research might eventually help us get there. During this meeting, they asked whether or not there are safer alternatives, because, you know, why would you do the dangerous thing if there's a safer thing you can do instead? And they pointed out that pseudotyping is one of these. Pseudotyping is where you take a virus that's completely benign to humans and you just add part of the dangerous virus that you want to study. So maybe you just want to put the spike protein, the outer protein that the virus uses to get inside of human cells, into a safe virus. And you do that through genetic engineering tricks. It was pointed out that while that can help us understand a lot it's not nearly as effective as studying the entire virus because the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Then, of course, there is large-scale comparative studies of wild viruses. Instead of setting up weird scenarios where a virus is guaranteed to evolve to adapt to humans, you could just collect lots of viruses in the wild, see what they do when you put them in human cells. Can any of them get into human cells? And if they can, you just look at well, how did they do it? What's different about them than these other ones that can't do this? You know, what, what are the specific mutations that we think that we can correlate to, you know, entry into human cells, entry into human respiratory systems? So that's an alternative. But as it was also pointed out, that's, that's still pretty dangerous. So it's not that much safer than gain-of-function research. And then to combat the, the issue of, you know, terrorists using this type of information to create a, a disease is when we publish these journals, when, when we publish our research, we don't have to tell people everything. We can tell them the main findings, but we don't have to give them like the gene sequence of the deadly virus. We don't have to tell them the step-by-step the -step recipe, the, the things that we did to make it. We don't have to give them that information. But, you know, to be honest, the information that's already published online is pretty, pretty freaking dangerous. And it actually might be a little bit too late for this anyways. So that's, those are the things that they discussed. Everything from that initial meeting, plus a lot more, eventually went into this risk and benefit analysis of gain-of-function research that was published in 2016. From that, we have new guidelines for what it is that the federal government will and will not fund. Those new guidelines came out in 2017. 
Also from all of that, some new agents were added to the CDC's Select Agents and Toxins list. This is the list of things that if you are messing with them in your laboratory, you will go to prison <laughs> for a very long time if you're caught without proper authority from the federal government. And they added to that SARS-associated coronaviruses. So you can't do these things unless a lot of people in the federal government know exactly what you're doing. Since 2017, there are two big projects that have been approved. It's not super clear if either of these projects are doing gain-of-function research, but they are doing risky research on very dangerous pathogens, and they, they do have approval. So where does this leave us? I think <laughs> this is such a complex problem. I do understand the value in this research. It really does help us understand how viruses work. And at this moment in history, I think that it's probably really important that we understand better, far better, how viruses work. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a huge advertisement to terrorists saying, hey, if you want to screw up the world, make a virus and let it loose. Like, I would not be surprised if sometime in the ne next 10 years we're going to see a real attack. And in order for us to combat such an attack, we need to understand how viruses work better than we do right now. And one of the best ways to understand how viruses work really is gain-of-function research. Aside from that possibility of terrorist groups, we also have factory farming expanding like never before. The human population is budding against bat populations all around the world. The chance of a new really nasty virus just evolving naturally is also extremely high, higher than it's ever been in the past, just because our population is so large now and so well connected. We really do need to understand how these viruses work, but we need to find a way to do it safely. Maybe one option is to start sunsetting these laboratories that exist in Atlanta, Georgia, these major cities, and start building out in deserts somewhere where employees will, you know, go in and, you know, come into work, work there for several months, then quarantine, then go back to civilization, spend a couple months off, and just work things out like that, because the risk just seems too high. So I would love to see an open debate started again. I know that we just had this from 2014 to 2017, but I think we need to do it again. I think we need to do it again in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. I think that it's fair to say that virology research is now as dangerous as nuclear research. Viruses are just one more thing that science has given us that we now have to constantly be worried about. We need to, we need to be responsible with this information that we've gained, and it's not going to be easy. That's unfortunate, but it is true. So, sweet dreams, everyone. Stay curious. Next question.